Well, let's open our Bibles this evening to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter number four. Ephesians chapter number four. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. I beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now this opening sentence in chapter 4 marks really a turning point in the book of Ephesus. We've not done a study of the book of Ephesus, but if we have done so, we would realize that chapters 1, 2, and 3 have really built up a fairly good-sized inventory of important truth and teaching. Uh, doctrine is a good word to use here. But now God, through his servant, Paul, is going to set forth how we are to put that doctrine to work in our lives. And that's the way the rest of the book of Ephesians goes. Now, God never has us learn truth without having a goal of us putting that truth into action. God's not all about you and I having big spiritual heads filled with all kinds of biblical knowledge and understanding if we're not going to live it out, if we're not going to put it into practice, if it's not going to change the way you and I live each and every day. And so God wants us to have practical action in our lives. So let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your goodness and thank you, Lord, for songs that uplift thy name and indeed all the songs the choir. Everything has been lifting you up and directing our hearts to worship you. We thank you for that and thank you, Lord, for the gift of music that you've blessed us with. Lord, we ask now, though, that as we come to the word of God, that our hearts would be open and receptive. Lord, there is some important learning that needs to take place as to how your truth can be lived out in our lives. So, Lord, uh, again, thank you for each one that is here. And, uh, Lord, we just pray that you would bless our time together in your word. In Jesus' name, we ask all of these things. Amen. I, therefore. Now, therefore might only be an adverb and a conjunction, but it is a word of great significance. Anytime you find the expressions therefore or wherefore in your Bible, that means it's going to be referring back to something that has been there previously. So it's always good to go back and try to discover that. And it's, going to, it's really referring back, Paul saying, I'm referring back now to all the truth that God has given to us. And it's truth that really highlights, I believe, the reality of the distinctiveness of biblical Christianity. What has been taking place here in this book to the church at Ephesus is some instruction that really highlights how different they were from everyone else in their city, how different they were from all other religions. And so the life work that we're going to talk about in just a moment uh, and we're about to discover and de is not a demand that's laid upon us that these verses we're going to look at is not something that God gives us uh, that we have to perform in order to somehow make us acceptable to God. What we're going to look at is because we are already acceptable to God because of the finished work of Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 and 10 actually are verses that get quoted an awful lot. But it says, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is what? It is the gift of God. Then it goes on what? Not of works. Why? Lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Always understand, you've got to have a proper chain of events if we understand salvation. We don't do good works in order to be saved. No, God says you do good works because of what has already taken place in your heart by grace and faith in Jesus Christ. 
So because that great truth has already been established, now Paul can write, therefore, it's after we know that by grace we are saved that then we can walk worthy of the vocation whereby, which by we've been called. And because of the tremendous supply of God that is ours by Jesus Christ, we can live uniquely in this sin-darkened world. Now, I want to read the verses leading up to chapter 4 if we could. So let's begin in verse 16 of chapter 3. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge and that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Boy, we have been loaded with all kinds of spiritual benefits. We have been able now to have, be filled with the love of Christ, and we are comprehended this wonder that God has given to us. And so now Paul says, because of all this, I therefore, I beseech you, I beg of you, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you've been called. Now, what is that vocation? What do you think of when you think of a vocation? Well, normally we think of a calling, of a career, of a choice, you know. Now, most of you, or many of you, know Mrs. Souza, one of our school teachers, and they, she and her husband are members at uh, City Baptist Church, of course, the church we helped to start, and, and uh, Mrs. Souza is married to John Souza. Now, how many... Very many of you know John? Okay, a lot of you know John. John Souza, I've known since he was a kid. He used to go to camp, junior camp. He's been around for a long time and uh, lived in this area. He wasn't part of our church family, but always came to camp faithfully every year. Well, John's had a dream in his life for many, many years, and that is he wanted to be an RCMP officer. And I'll tell you, that's been something that's been on his heart for a long time. Sort of Mrs. Hallmark's with us tonight. She stayed over the weekend from camp. Sort of like their son David dreamed about being an officer in the RCMP for a long time. Well, for Brother Souza, it's going to happen, become a reality on Tuesday. And so uh, we rejoice with him. He's been in Saskatchewan now for I don't know how many weeks the training is, six, six months? six months and so he graduates on Tuesday and uh, they're all rejoicing at City Baptist because he is being uh, uh, posted in Coquitlam and so we're happy because that means Mrs. Susan gets to continue teaching for us and what a great blessing that is and so I know that he is so looking forward to embracing that vocation as a police officer but you know that vocation and all vocations like that will one day come to an end. One day, should Lord Terry is coming, he'll retire from being an RCMP officer. One day, whatever it is that you're doing as a job, as a career, you'll retire from that. You know, one day, uh, really, everything will come to an end. So what is our vocation? What is it that he's talking about that we're to walk worthy? Our vocation is one that goes into eternity, and it is our calling to the gospel. You see, the reality is you and I, who have been saved by God's grace, you know, we are, we are going to be Christians forever. That's our vocation. That's something that's never going to end. We are saved now and for eternity. And so often we wrap up our worth, our value. I guess men are probably more into this. We invariably, you meet somebody new and what comes out? What do you do for a living? You know, what kind of work do you do? And so we sort of identify with the kind of employment that we have, the kind of career that we've gone after. Well, here we are challenged to walk worthy of our calling, our true vocation to the gospel. We are now children of the king and therefore we should live in a fashion that honors that position. So Paul, God's prisoner, as he says here in verse 1, and in many, way, in many ways, but even now in a physical sense, says, I beseech you, I'm appealing to you from a heart of great love that ye walk worthy. Now, 
The term walk is used a lot in the Bible, and Paul uses it quite a bit, and he uses it here in this book of Ephesians. Let's look at chapter 5 and verse 2. Notice he says, and walk in love as Christ has loved us. Verse number 8, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. A little bit further down in verse 15, see then that ye walk circumspectly, that means carefully, not as fools, but as wise. So Paul likes this. It's one of his favorite metaphors, and he repeats it several times over. And this idea of walking means it is the journey of your life. And the word worthy that he uses is a word that means of being of equal weight. So what Paul is saying with us, that we live our lives in an equal fashion of what we have received. If we've been blessed with a great deal, God says walk worthy of that. Walk in a way that reflects what you have given, been given. So what does is, what is walking worthy look like? Well, he goes on to tell us. Verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He says, I want you to walk worthy of this vocation wherewith you've been called with all lowliness. So what does God mean by lowliness? Well, it's often translated in our Bibles, also translated humility. I found it interesting to discover that in Greek society, humility was actually looked down upon. People didn't have much time for humble people. In fact, really, it was something that only the servants and slaves should practice. What was admired in Greek society were those that could be complete and confident, great people, men and women who had control over their own destiny and were ruling over others. Humility, really, when it came to the city of Ephesus, was not really much there. Now, its roots were in Grecian culture and then was built upon by the Romans, and so Actually, though, this word lowliness is a word that is a product of Christian influence. It was one of those words that was rarely ever used until the Lord Jesus came along and set himself as the example. So here, in stark contrast to Ephesian society, and dare I say, in stark contrast to our own society, Paul tells us that a worthy walk is one that is built upon humility of mind and spirit. We'll look at a couple of verses here tonight, but turn with me over to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5. Verse number five. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Same word. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Hmm. God says, I resist the proud. Those that are proud, I sort of work against, I stand against them, but he says, I'll lift up those that are humble. I'm concerned that we have this spirit of humility. You ever notice that pride has a way of creeping in and taking up residence in each one of us? Now, I know that all of you are so humble here tonight. But you know, if you listen carefully to the way that we talk and our speech, it's often colored with elements of pride. You ever find yourself thinking that someone is weird just because they think or do things differently than you do? Oh, no, not me. I would never do that. Hmm. Can I tell you that that attitude hinders a worthy walk? Proverbs tells us only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Philippians tells us let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. So God says, you know what? 
I, I, I beg of you, you've been given so much, so much in Christ. You're not, we're not talking about doing these things to be saved, but God says because you've, you've received so much, so many blessings, and we'd all say amen to that. He says walk worthy of that. Walk worthy of that in lowliness. And then he goes on to say, and in meekness. Walk worthy in lowliness and meekness. Now, meekness is a companion to humility, but we should understand that meekness is in no way to be confused with weakness. Meekness is really uh, strength and power, but strength and power that is under governance. It's under complete control. You see, meekness understands and knows the power or authority that it possesses, but it's ready to hold that back. It's ready to submit to others for the cause of Christ. Now, we know the Lord Jesus Christ. He is omnipotent God come in the flesh. And yet, what did he say in Matthew chapter 11? He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. See, a lot of times we don't have rest in our souls. We're agitated, we're stirred up, and it's because we have not learned of him. Jesus said, all power is given unto me. There's nothing that I cannot do, but he said, you know what? If you'll learn of me, you'll understand that I am meek. That is, that my power has been submitted to the will of God at this time. And then he went on to live out his meekness, did he not? You know, the Bible tells us that he could have called, in fact, he said himself, I could have called 12 legions of angels to come to my rescue. But the Bible tells us that he went to the cross as a lamb before the slaughter that opened not his mouth. His power was under control. He also set the example of meekness when he washed the disciples' feet in the upper room. That willingness to serve stands as a a picture of strength not demanding its own. Remember, he said when he was all done, he said, you call me Lord and Master, and you're right to do so. But you should be doing to each other as I've done to you. Serving to meet the needs of others. In Mark chapter 9... I'll get you to turn there. In verse 33, Mark chapter 9 and verse 33. And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them. This is great. I talked a little bit about this at camp this week in our staff devotions. What was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? So the, Lord, the Lord's practice would, he would travel, and as they went from town to town, he would sort of lead the way. He was the one who was choosing the path they were going to go. And as they would go, a lot of times they would visit along the way. I mean, you didn't have anything else to do. You didn't have earbuds to put in or games to play on your iPad as you walked along, and so you had to talk or be quiet. And most people usually chose to talk. And so... The disciples had been talking, and because of the content of their conversation, they backed away a little bit. I think the Lord knew that he was, you know, he was a little bit ahead, but he heard them in very agitated discussion. And so when they got into Capernaum, got into the home, he sort of turned around and said, hey, what were you guys talking about? You were really in a discussion there. Verse 34 says, but they held their peace. For by the way, they had disputed among themselves who should be, what? The greatest. So these guys who were constantly with each other were constantly, we find in the scripture, constantly going after this thing that when Jesus came into his own, into this kingdom that they were expecting that was not going to happen right then as they thought it was going to happen. But they were all arguing about who's going to be the greatest in that kingdom. And so... He sat down and called the twelve and saith unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. You ever notice that most of the time when there's trouble over who is the greatest, there's also trouble over who's going to be the least. Now most of us know we're not going to be the greatest. But nobody wants to be at the bottom of the pile. You know, okay, if I'm not first, that's okay. I can live with that. Somebody else can be the greatest, but I don't want to be the least. 
Meekness is a willingness even to be least if that's God's plan and God's will. You know, I wonder at times how churches would be better served by a membership that would determine to embrace meekness. Well, let's go back to our text because there's more things here. With all lowliness and meekness, notice with long suffering. With long suffering. Now, it's a word, and again, these words oftentimes are translated with different English concepts. It, it, it is also translated patience in a few places. Long suffering means just that, suffering for a long period of time. It's, a, it, it's an attitude of not giving up on the right kinds of things. It's the idea that even though we might try something and we might fail or something that goes wrong or sour for us, it's not enough to make us stop pressing on. Long suffering means for believers to continue moving in the right direction. There's a verse in Proverbs 24 that says, a just man, that's a guy who's doing right, a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. What is God saying? He said, well, you're going to fail at times, but if your heart's right and you're seeking after me, you're going to get up again. You're not going to stay down. You're going to continue to press on. That's what long suffering is all about. And it's also aimed at our relationships with one another. And it's an attitude that doesn't give up on someone else who, uh, and, and someone who is willing to work on damaged relationships. Really to recognize that sometimes we have to accept the bad with the good. And realizing that sometimes when it comes to our interaction with each other, we all mess up at times. How many of you husbands have said something wrong to your wife and you realized it? Um, I was going to say too late, but then I, I won't say it that way. <laughs> not a one of you. Look at that. Not a hand raised. I'll tell you. Okay, all right, ladies, let me ask you. How many of you ladies have ever said something wrong to your husband? Okay. Ladies are humble and gentle. The guys are still... Okay, guys, let's go back to the first part of the verse. All lowliness and meekness. You say, Pastor, that wasn't fair. You didn't put your hand up like you normally do. We get that idea. Too often, I'm afraid, we're more ready to discard a broken relationship than to try to fix it and rebuild it. Here's another interesting bit of information that the word literally means a long temper. I found that inner, a long temper. And it, 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 it's defined as this, someone who has the right to take revenge but chooses not to. Someone who has the right to take revenge but chooses not to. Proverbs, again, in Proverbs 24 says, the Lord said, say not, I will do so to him as he hath done to me. That's a radical thought. Because most of us live by the maxim, don't get mad, get even. Right? And yet the word of God says what? Say not, I will do so to him as he hath done to me. Then God goes on to say, I will render to the man according to his work. Give it to me. Hmm. So I wonder if you're a person with a short temper or a long temper. All loneliness and meekness with long suffering. And then verse 2 finishes, forbearing one another in love. Now, the expression of forbearing one another in love means to, I think it means more than just putting up with each other. I think it's a proactive stance. It's, it's like getting a little spiritual WD-40. And when things begin to get a little bit irritated, see what you can do to squirt a little stuff on there to see if you can smooth things over and take care of things. And, and every time you hear an irritating squeak, if nothing else, squirt it on yourself so you'll be able to deal with it. Be proactive and honest to understand that none of us are the same. We all are unique. We all look at things differently. And every individual has different needs. And of course, we should take note of the word forbearing in love. That's our old friend agape love. A love like no other. A love built on giving. A love that thinks more about others than ourselves. First Peter also talks about that we should strive now that we have brotherly love philadelphia 
that we might commit ourselves, desire agape love also. And then look at verse number three, because this really all ties to this verse. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavor means to to work towards something. There's a sense of urgency and a willingness to make every effort. So it's pretty evident that God intends of his people in his churches to work at preserving unity of heart and spirit. Did you know that? That's what God wants for us as a church. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll look at two verses or two passages. 1 Corinthians and then Philippians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So right back to the very beginning. And of course, there was a problem in Corinth. There was division. The house of Chloe told Paul, there's battles going on, contentions taking place. And so in verse 10 of chapter 1, Paul says, now I beseech you, there it is again, that begging, I'm pleading with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, notice, that ye all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. God says, I want you to be thinking the same way. I want you to be moving in the same direction. You say, does that mean that we, we have to agree on everything? No, not that, that's not what God's talking about. He's talking about, though, that there's got to be a unity in the direction, a unity of the Spirit. Now, if you go to Philippians chapter 2, It's the book after Ephesians, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, and again, remember that's the inner being, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing, we read this verse, or I gave it to you earlier, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. You see, God has placed this all together. He states through Paul that because of the powerful privilege and the truth that we have been given, because we know that we are saved by grace, because we have all of this, uh, our God who is able to do exceeding abundantly, he said, you and I, therefore, we should determine to walk worthy of this abundant supply that's been given to us. And so we need to embrace attitudes of lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance and love, all of which is needed in our relationship so that we can preserve preserve and protect the unity of the spirit which God desires for us to have in our church. And he says, in the bond of peace. Now the previous virtues depend on us getting self out of the way. You know, this is a vital principle which is What we as a New Testament church are dependent upon, it makes for peace. You see, within any church, within our church, every member must be willing to give up on their self-interest for the benefit of someone else. As long as it's about my feelings, my prestige, my, my ideas, my interests, if those things matter more to me than anything else, let me tell you something, there will be no peace. There'll be an undercurrent of agitation. There'll be something going on, ruffled feathers, and people will be, you know, grumbling about each other. Now, peace in the local church is not a a formal peace. It's not imposed and maintained by authority. It's a peace that flows from a membership that is endeavoring by God's grace to walk worthy of our vocation. And that we are bound together by love. Psalm 133, David looked out over the people. He said, behold, how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. Now, I want to look at a couple more verses and I'll be done. Here we have really a description of our unity. And I want you to see it. Verse number four, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. 
one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One body. That's what he says, one body. Now this is not some mystical concept of a universal church. I've been very clear. A universal church does not exist. Family of God exists, but a universal church doesn't because a, a church is a called out assembly. There's no way that it's going to be universal. And so we have to think, oh, wait a minute. Well, this book of Ephesians was written to what? The church at Ephesus. So there is one, one body there. And we need to understand something, that there had been a problem amongst these very believers. There was a separation over racial and religious lines. The Jew and Gentile thing was really big there in Ephesus. In fact, in chapter 2, well, I'm not going to talk, we'll not take time to look at it, but he talked about how here's the Gentiles over here, they're alienated from the house of God, and here's the Jews over here, but he talks about the sacrifice of Christ has broken down the middle wall of partition that separated us and is made out of two, one. That's what God's talking about. It's brought us all together. You know, we as a church family need to embrace the reality that we are one body, Christ is our head, and we are members one of another. We are not several bodies identified by uh, race or nationality or where we were born or, or, or what kind of work we do. God says that we are one in Christ. There's one body, the whole body. The same chapter 4 goes on, but verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working and the measure of every part maketh increase of one, the body unto the edifying of itself in love. God says Christ is our head. We're all connected one with another and we're all to be busy doing what we can to edify one another and build each other up so that this this body, that's what we are, is healthy and strong and unified in Christ. One body. Notice what else he says. One body and one spirit. Not many spirits, just one. It's God the Holy Spirit who indwells each believer. You ever, you ever think about that sometimes? Do you ever address the Holy Spirit? Hey, God. Are you in there? It's a little bit silly, but the reality is the Bible says that our body is what? The temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you. Romans says, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. So you have God the Holy Spirit in you. Do you have him? This is not a trick question. Do you have him? If you're saved, you do. So is he divided? Is he different? Is he different in one person than he is in another person? You know what? I always admire, we have so many people here that speak more than one language. I always admire people who can speak more than one language. I can't even speak English good. He is, he can speak every language. Any language of a believer, he can communicate. But he's one God. And so there's one spirit. Where would we be without the Holy Spirit at work in our lives? Hmm. You know, it is he that convicts us. It is he that comforts us. It is he that empowers us for service. And oh, how we need his mighty, unifying presence. Let's be careful not to quench his work. Let's be careful not to grieve him with our sin. One body, one spirit. Notice what else he says. And even as you're called in one hope of your calling. Now, what's the common hope? Well, that common hope is to be with Christ one day. Amen? Right? First Thessalonians talks about looking for that blessed hope, and the, or Titus does, and that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, the reality is for you and I, that is our hope that one day we're going to be with him. And it doesn't matter, I, I, I mean, 
As I mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, Mrs. Reed always wanted to talk about the upper taker, not the undertaker. But regardless of whether I die or be caught up in a moment in a twinkle of an eye, the reality is I have this undergirding grace and peace of God because I know where I'm going to go. That is my hope. Hmm. That's why we sometimes say sad day, glad day. Our hope is that one day all of this and all of this around us will pass away. We'll have new bodies, a new home, and a new perfect relationship with the Lord. And it goes on then in verse 5, one Lord. Now that's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Go back to Ephesians chapter 1. And I'll begin reading in verse number 20, okay? Ephesians 1 verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ... When he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Wow. Wow. You know, it doesn't really matter to me what the, Lord, what the world may think. We have one Lord, and one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. One Lord, verse 5 says, and then it says one faith. One faith. As our one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, has given us one faith in him for salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And one faith means a unity of doctrine and teaching and understanding of the word of God. Now, folks, we live in a day where everybody's doing their own thing. Everybody can choose what they want to do, go where they want to go, believe what they want to go, and but this infection of a plurality of belief and toleration has weakened the strength of our testimony in the world. And you can see it in the, you know, many, many roads to whatever type of idea, but Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But this plurality of doctrine has also served to dilute the truth to such a place where it really, I don't think it has any power. There must be, listen to me carefully, there must be a unity in our teaching. Now I want to show you something. Let's go to 1 Timothy, if you would please. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and then we'll go back to Acts chapter 20. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Now Paul's writing to his son in the faith, right? Timothy, Timotheus, all right? Verse 3, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia. So Timothy was in Ephesus. He was the pastor there of that church. I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Hmm. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience and a faith unfeigned. So Timothy was instructed by Paul as he pastored the church at Ephesus that he would charge them that they would not teach any other doctrine. It's hard to believe that in those early decades really of Christian faith that there was already a plurality of teaching coming in and creeping into the churches and Timothy's job as the shepherd was to go out and to defend his flock and to make certain that no other doctrine was being taught now let's go to the book of Acts if you would chapter 20 Verse 17, and from Miletus he sent to, what does it say? Ephesus, 
and called the elders of the church. Those are the men that were pastoring at this time, a different time period. So he called them, and they came out, and they met with him. And he says a number of things, but I want, I want to go to verse 28, if I may. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God with its purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember... And by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Same place, Ephesus. Now, the reality is the instruction was given to them to make certain that they stayed in one faith. Now, I understand one faith may not always attract those who want to promote their own version of truth or their pet doctrine, but it will keep us consistent in our direction and our unity in the spirit. One body, one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Yes, there's but one. Requires the right candidate. Somebody's already saved, the right purpose to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. The right method. Yes, immersion in water. That's what baptism means. A right authority. New Testament churches. And then verse 6, he says, and one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. You see, we all indeed share the same Heavenly Father. And though there's a broad understanding here of God over all the universe, I think it really applies here because he's writing to this church. It, it talks about God's relationship with us. That he's over us, he is in us, he is through us. So much that you... And I cannot really be part of his body unless we've been born again by his spirit. Hmm. You know what? I believe God wants what verse 6 says for Greater Vancouver Baptist Church. He wants to be one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Do you think that would make an impact on how we go about doing church? That's why I enjoyed the songs tonight. We, did, I didn't, we didn't orchestrate this at all. Only God. And then a song that speaks of all the names of God and who he is and uplifts him. God says, that's what I want to be. I want to be, I want to be God of you. I want to be over you. I want to be in you. I want to be intermingling with you. I want to be here. I want, to, I want you to know my presence. You know, God has been so good to us. A lot of blessings that have come our way. Can we not hear the words of the apostle? Because of all that God's done, can I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation of what you've been called? And just when you begin to think, you know what, preacher, I don't know this lowliness, meekness, forbearing and love, this unity... I don't know if I'm up to this. I don't know if that's possible. I want you to notice verse 7 and I'll be done. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. There's the promise of God. God says, look, in yourselves, you're not going to be able to do this. Even though you might say, boy, I'm so glad I've been blessed and I'm so thankful for all God's done and, and, and I want to I do these things, but I don't think I can. God says, that's okay because I'm giving you the measure of grace and you can't measure that grace because it's of Christ. Does Christ or his grace ever run out? No. You know, this church was a wonder of God's grace. And that makeup of that church was a tremendous diversity. They, have, they come from all kinds of religions and identifiable races. And, and they moved, came from different regions and multiple languages. And they were all brought together by what? The miracle of the new birth. 
The Apostle Paul was allowed by God to spend more time in the city of Ephesus than any other city in his ministry. And Timothy, his his son in the faith, was the pastor there as well. But in spite of all the blessing given to that church, it was evident that Satan was busy at work and if they were not sober, if they were not vigilant, if they yielded to their old prejudices and patterns, the whole thing could disintegrate before their eyes. And so God writes by his spirit. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Paul said to those Ephesian elders, he said, do you remember when I was with you, I ceased not to warn you day and night, day and night, day and night with tears. Beware, beware, be on the lookout. The devil is going to do all that he can to destroy you and divide you and, and, and disperse you. Timothy, make certain nobody's preaching any other doctrine." Paul writes by the Spirit of God, I now, because you've been given so much, you, have, you possess so much, he said, I beseech you, walk worthy of the vocation that you have received. And I honestly believe that that warning rings down through the ages all the way to right now and even right here in Vancouver. You know, we've been given so much in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's so much that binds us together. And I want to I urge all of us, and I include me in this, because the old flesh likes to rise up within us, and we like to rely upon our carnal view of life rather than in a spiritual view of life. Let us walk worthy of our God and Savior, and let us live in the fullness of His Spirit. Let's walk in lowliness. Let's have meekness. Let's be long-suffering. Let's forbear with one another in love. Let's endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence, and godly fear, because if we have grace, then we will not become weary in well-doing.